business or are you running a business? Valuation is the ultimate KPI. Hey, it's Mike Lankford. Welcome to the Modern Financial Advisor podcast brought to you by Truelytics, the one and only comprehensive advisor transition management platform. This week on the show, I have Laurie Barkman, CEO of Small Dot Big, a strategic advisory firm for owners of small to mid-sized companies that helps maximize enterprise value, create succession plans, and identify M&A strategies. I invited Laurie to come on the podcast so we could explore how financial advisors can better serve their business owner clients who are either in transition or will be in the not too distant future. We also dive into some really interesting concepts around attracting entrepreneurs who might be on the cusp of a liquidity event to become your clients. This is a fantastic conversation. You know, we spend a lot of time on the show talking about transitions and M&A activity for independent financial advisors and RAAs, but here we're going to be tackling that concept from a completely different angle. We're going to be talking about how you can better serve business owners, right? Entrepreneurs who have built a business and they might be looking to exit the business and how do you go about attracting those folks and then serving them when they are thinking about going through that transition? It's really, really fantastic stuff. But before we get to all that goodness, please do make sure you subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, SoundCloud, the YouTubes, or wherever you like to get your podcast jam on. And if you have a question or a suggestion for a topic or a guest for the show, shoot us an email, podcast at truelytics.com or swing by the website and use that little contact form. We would love to hear from you. Okay, let's transition to my conversation with Laurie Barkman. Laurie Barkman, Wonderful to see you. Welcome to the Modern Financial Advisor podcast. Thanks, Mike. I'm excited to be here. I know, and you should be. As we were talking about before this, I'm fully caffeinated. I hope you are as well. And, and you know, we, just, we were bringing the energy even before we clicked the record button today. So it's, it's, it's really fun to meet a kindred spirit. Uh, you have a wonderful show yourself, so you know how this process goes. So I think we're going to be just crushing it today, and the audience is in for a treat. Absolutely. 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 Exactly. Well, um, I want to kind of uh, sort of dive right into why you're on the show and, and your team reached out and I thought it was a wonderful fit. You know, we spend a lot of time on on this show talking about advisor transitions, right? You know, Truelytics, as people hear in the intro every time, is, is the one and only uh, comprehensive advisor transition management platform, right? And so then, and, and we produce the show for Truelytics. And so we talk a lot about that concept, right? So, you know, financial advisors and RIA firm owners, they're, they're, they're selling their business or they're thinking about succession planning, um, or maybe they're on the acquisition side, right? They're thinking about buying another advisor's book of business or buying another RIA firm and so forth. So myself and, and the team at Truelytics have a deep, deep understanding of, you know, these sellers and buyers and, and what makes them tick and, you know, the core drivers of a successful transition or transaction uh, in, in, in the process for uh, being successful in that process. Oh, successful in the process? Yeah, sure. Why not? Uh, so today we're going to be taking a, a, a kind of a different angle on transitions and M&A activity from the perspective of potential clients, right? Like, so financial advisors, maybe working with entrepreneurs who are selling the business or thinking about retiring from the business and doing a succession plan internally or what have you. So let's dive right into that. How do you and the small dot big team help entrepreneurs with transitions? Mike, it is a journey. And my <laughs> journey as a business transition Sherpa is to help business owners who are contemplating pretty significant change as you talked about, that change in ownership, the change in their life. And it can be a very daunting process. Entrepreneurs don't build businesses on their own, and they shouldn't work with the process on their own to exit the business. So it's a really important part of the journey of being an entrepreneur. Let's face it, all of us are going to leave our business at some point. 100% of us will. And so are we going to be proactive in that? Are we going to take active steps to do that? Or are we going to just watch it happen? And so that's part of my mission is working with entrepreneurs to help them build value and when they're ready to let it go. I really love that. And you just, by, by the way, quick little aside here, you were the second guest ever on this show uh, to use the Sherpa term uh, for yourself. And, I, and, and, and I, I love it. And for those who are, aren't aware, like Sherpas are the, are the, are the, the guides and the, 
frankly, human pack mules, if you will, who have not only the skill, but the stamina and the, um, and then like just the, the physical makeup, if you will, uh, in their case, to help people get up mountains, right? In the Himalayas and so forth. And uh, the other guest who used that, by the way, was Ivan Barreto, who uh, runs a, a an outsourced compliance firm. RA Compliance Concepts is, is the name of it. And he he was talking about his personal life. <laughs> He go. He said, we, "We went on vacation." He's like, "And that's dad. I'm the vacation Sherpa, right? Like I'm carrying all this stuff." And everything. <laughs> but you know, I, I like the term, and I, I really do it because, like many of the climbers who are going to Everest or to to other places to climb a mountain, uh, usually they're doing it once, and they're doing it for their very first time, and it is somewhat a life and death situation, right? You, you know. And I, you know, it's not as dramatic when you're selling a business, right? But it there is an element to that, right? It's like, hey, listen, get it wrong, and the consequences are somewhat irreversible and could be very negative, right? Uh, and so working with somebody who's actually been through the process many times, like yourself and the small dot big team, uh, is really, really important. So I love the fact that that's how you've, you've kind of, you know, uh, articulated who you are or what you do. There's a couple of aspects to that I just want to circle back on. Mm. One is the DNA side. A Sherpa in the Mount Everest context literally has different DNA to enable yeah. them to withstand the the altitude and 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 function at such a high level physically. Their their blood carries differently in their bodies. For me and my DNA, I think largely it's about some of the experience that I've had as an operator in a business. I was a CEO. I, I ran small marketing teams, big marketing teams, big budgets and everything in between at fast growing companies and, and multiple industries. When I was a CEO, I was in the transportation logistics industry and we went through a M&A transaction. We were sold to a very, very large company. And as, as a executive that goes through that process and I got to see it from the inside, obviously the playbook from the acquiring company, when they're a global, you know, a global entity, they're very, very experienced at the lower middle market. When a company is looking to buy or sell, there's still a playbook at, at, at hand. If you've done this a number of times, if you haven't done it before, you're right. It is very daunting and it's probably your one time at bat. So why not surround yourself with people who can support you in that process? So for me, that's where Business Transition Sherpa comes from. And also just a little fun fact, when I was thinking about that as, a, as an analogy of some sort for what I do, it was because, not because I went to Everest, but I did go trekking in Nepal and we wow. did have some Sherpas. My husband and I did this years and years ago, about 25 years ago. And they they carried some backpacks for me <laughs> and for him too, but mostly for me. And uh, they'd also go leech, leech. And then they'd flick little leeches off my ankles if there were oh. leeches <laughs> climbing onto my socks, <laughs> climbing up to see Mount Dalagiri and, uh, from afar, which is the sixth tallest mountain in the world. So anyway, that was, those were fun memories. And I, we definitely valued our Sherpas at that time. So I, that's, that's my hope is that working with people who are looking to have this major transition in their life to be able to support them at that time in this time. I love it. And by the way, I can't even imagine the chaos that would happen if my <laughs> wife and I were hiking uh, and, and, and there was a leech on <laughs> On either well, one of us, by the way. Uh, the Sherpa I, didn't speak a lot of English, but yeah. he knew Leech, and he knew he had I, to make, keep me happy <laughs> in this in kidding. this transaction. I was the one just, that needed to I be just, kept happy. And, <laughs> and we might have just ruined my, make sure. we might have just ruined my son's <laughs> vision. Like he, he's he he's talked about how he would love to go to Nepal, and play, you know, he's he's a travel guy. He just loves. He's seventeen years old. Just he, he loves anytime we go anywhere and it doesn't have to be any place fantastic. We go to San Antonio or just like a, you know, just a normal city. And he's like, this is awesome. He just loves travel. But he's talked about wanting to go to some of these, you know, more uh, adventurous locations. Uh, I think you just ruined him because like, there's no way this guy can't handle mosquitoes. There's no way he's handling leeches. <laughs> <laughs> they were tiny in fairness. They were tiny, but they were still uh, little bloodsuckers. So yeah. <laughs> he's just going to be like canceled. <laughs> that place is off. It wears no, no, no. City. He should We're definitely go. Don't rule it out. Don't, don't let him listen to this. Yeah. You just put the <laughs> earmuffs on. No, oh. that's for That's terrific. That's terrific. Well, I, I again, building on this topic a little bit, uh, you know, 
this is an emotional process, right? And, and, and I think many advisors, they understand this, right? They are the Sherpa for their clients' lives, if you will, for their financial lives. Like most, even successful people who have made millions of dollars or making, you know, solid six figures or high six figures in their in their career, they, most of them don't know how to manage personal finances. That, that That's not what they're good at. They're making money on doing the thing that they're doing, leading the company they're doing, or they're a lawyer, they're a doctor, they're a tech, you know, they're a you know, computer science, you know, coder dude type of thing, right? Uh, that's what they do. They're not experts in, in managing money. Um, they're experts in making money at what they do. And, you know, as a result, they, they look lean on another expert, right? Financial advisor to help them with that type of stuff. So I, I think advisors kind of get that, that Sherpa analogy and, and they can appreciate it. And so hopefully they're perking up as a paying attention here. Uh, one of the things other mo most advisors also have some experience with is, is working with clients who are business owners, right? Many of them, you know, and oftentimes some of the most valuable clients are business owners, right? Because that's generally how you build wealth is owning a business. Um, we're going to be talking about financial advisors working with business owners or finding business owners who might be ready to transition their business or getting ready to it to do so. I think in depth here, at what stage should that conversation happen between an advisor and, and, and the client, right? So let's just say I've got, a, I've got a client, he's owned a business for 25 years or she's owned a business for 25 years. They've had a client of mine for 10 or something like that. So great relationship. When should the advisor go, hey, when are you thinking about selling this business, transitioning out of this business? We should start talking about plans to do so. How early do you recommend having that type of conversation? When do you, when do you start having the conversation? The process takes a while. Mm. It varies by person. And it really depends on what the outcome is going to be. If yeah. they want to sell to a third party, if they want to transition to family, if they want to transition to management, if they want to sell to a financial buyer, if they want to sell to a strategic buyer, if they want to perhaps explore a ESOP, which is a combination of some outside financing and employee ownership um, through, a, through a, a formal program. So if we begin with the end in mind, to quote Stephen Covey, there are a range of exit options. And I believe it's great to have options. The more yeah. options we have, the more comfortable over time we are that one of those options will work in our favor. If you only have one option and it falls through, then what? And I've, I have a, a podcast, as you mentioned, Succession Stories. I had a guest on the show who acquires companies. One of the companies that he acquired is a sausage company. They make sausage that you buy in the supermarket. And it's a brand, a branded product. And the sad story was that the founder, um, the founder's son died in a plane crash oh, no. and there was no, there was no successor. The, the, when that happened, the founder was in his, I would say young eighties and it was wow. a very sad situation. And so of course they didn't plan on that, right? They didn't plan on that happening. And so rather than having a succession to the family, they sold. They sold it to the person who came on my show. And there are stories like that where you just cannot anticipate everything. So if we have the luxury of time, if time is on our side, then it is good to explore different options. And at some point, you'll sort of choose one and really go hard on that. But know that you might have other others in, in to work on if, if possible. And <clears throat> if we also think about the, the options as buckets, right? And thinking about the types of transition, it'll lead you to make different decisions. So if you're leaning towards transition to family and the next generation are in their teens or their 20s, you probably have some years of gap. There's a company that I know here locally and my friends were in that situation. They were the intended successors, but they were in their 20s. So they hired an outside uh, leader to mentor and run the company until that generation was ready. And it was very successful in doing so. 
But there are times when you say, you know, we don't have people internally or the market's frothy and it has been for years for private equity markets specifically. The market can be for private companies can also be pretty frothy for strategic buyers. So we could talk Mm. a little bit about who's a strategic buyer and who's a financial buyer Um, and how those how those um, options come forward. Also, I think you have to be pretty intentional about it. If you do intend to sell to a third party, that takes time. So the short answer to your question is, Mike, the getting ready stage to prepare a company for sale can really take years. And if you think about it, a a business owner, someone who runs that business, it's good economic sense. All the things that we would do to help get a business ready is thing or things that are going to help make your business stronger. Yeah. So in reality, if they have the mindset towards building a transferable business that has increasing value, it's all good stuff to do anyway, right? So the 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 tongue in cheek answer is, well, you really should be doing this every day. But in yeah. reality, we don't think that way. A firm that has a time horizon, an owner has a time horizon more aligned with their age is pretty common. So if there's someone who's saying, I want to retire when I'm 70, then we can work backwards. Yeah. If it's someone who's more of a mountain climber, you know, quite literally, that's looking for that next mountain to go to conquer, and they're more of a serial entrepreneur, that's a different conversation because they're going to be very opportunistic and looking to perhaps have a shorter timeline, faster pace to accelerate value, and look to sell and and move on to the next project, next company. So two very different types of owners in that situation. Most commonly, we do see the age-based. I want to retire when I'm 60. Okay. So what's a shorthand? Probably five to seven years-ish. And in that math would be the getting really getting ready phase, I think, is a good solid two to three year depending on the nature of the business. And when you make a decision, let's say to exit to a third party sale, that process can be anywhere from six months to two Mm. years. It's no guarantee that it's going to move quickly. And obviously there's a lot of uh, caveats there about the nature of the business and, and risks associated with it that will constitute the timeline and, uh, and the dynamics of that sale. I love the fact that, so this advice that you're giving and this, 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 this kind of, uh, you know, just the I don't know, like viewpoint of like how you should think about this is, is something that's relevant not only to the advisor's clients, but the advisors themselves, right? Again, you know, the average age of a financial advisor today, we talk about all the time is around 60. Sometimes you see 62 or whatever, but it, you know, most advisors, they are, are closer to the end of their career than the beginning of their career. So they should be thinking this way too. A lot of the things you just talked about, right? Time is is an opportunity, right? You can plan, you have more options. I love the fact that you laid out, like the more time you have, the more options you have, the more you can think about like how you might, which one's more preferable. If I'm compressed for time, I might only have one option, right? And it, it could be that emergency sale. We've, we've had some conversations on this podcast about emergency continuity planning, right? Or just having something in place, like God forbid something happens to you, uh, at least have some steps in place if, you know, you sudden deaths, disability, or what have you of of you or one of your partners or whatever, like, what do you do? Like, who do you call? What, you know, all this type of stuff. Um, but I like the, th- the th- thought process of having this conversation early uh, with the client and starting to talk about what those options might look like. Because for most of, most people who own businesses, that's usually their single largest asset, the largest pool of wealth. And if you are a financial advisor, you, you, you're doing a disservice by not including that in the the advice process you talk about. Like when is the liquidity event coming or when is the stream of cash flows that you take out of that business going to stop? Like because you retired or, or going to be altered, right? Like do we know what it might look like? If you're pulling out $700,000 a year in income from a business and you're 60 years old today, at 70, is it still gonna be $700,000 or is it going to start to decline gradually over time is it gonna be an earn out or is it just gonna be a lump sum like was it so this is a real financial concept to have uh, 
there's another part of the conversation that I think needs to happen too. And it's, you've probably, as a Sherpa in this area, you've probably had this conversation a lot is the emotional component. I kind of mentioned emotional earlier, but man, like when you're a business owner and I can relate and you can relate, I assume, uh, your business is kind of part of who you are. When people ask you, when people meet you for the first time, the thing they always ask you is, what do you do, right? And you I own a business or I run a company that does this. You know, we, we, I invented this product. Whatever it is that you do, uh, you talk about it. And, and for many of these people, uh, just like our advisor population, they've been doing it for decades, you know, building this business. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's, they, they, their children have grown up in the business. They, they know their, the families of their clients and their employees. This business is 100% a part of their identity. So it can be very emotional to even talk about <laughs> letting this business go or leaving the business. Like it's hard to envision, like what the heck am I going to do with myself? Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, financial advisors are skilled at helping their clients with their, with their emotional journeys as it relates to money or their, their portfolios. Right. It's part of the reason why you hire an advisor. And so, you know, you don't make radical swings all over the place because, you know, you're nervous about the stock market being down yesterday. And, and then next thing you know, it's up again, like just let the advisor do this. He or she knows what they're doing. Uh, what are some of your tips for guiding clients through this roller coaster of a transition? Because we've heard about this a lot. We've talked about M and A activity on the show, and man, it can be it can derail a deal, right? At the last minute, the advisor is getting cold feet, or just decides you know he or she doesn't want to let go, uh, or is gets more demanding. They're so. And it's, it's logical. Uh, what are your tips for navigating that process? That's why readiness is so important. As humans, we, we physically resist something if we're not ready. We'll dig our feet mm. in the ground, literally, right? We don't want to go somewhere and we're not going. And it's the same thing with the decision to sell. We look at what's called pull factors and push factors, and we have okay. some data from the value builder system. I'm a certified value builder advisor in addition to being a certified M&A advisor. And the value builder system is wonderful because we have data from more than 65,000 companies, business owners who use the platform, and we can do analysis on what we observe. One of the things we observe is this element of value creation by having a more ready business. And a more ready business, by the way, is three legs of a stool, personal readiness, financial readiness, and business readiness. And it all boils down to the balancing act of risk and value creation. And risk is in the perception of, of the buyer, really. And it translates to, to the multiple, which translates to the transaction value or the, the selling price. So it's in the owner's best interest to have a sellable or sale ready business, even if they don't mm. want to sell, even if they intend to transition to the next generation, it's still going to be building value, right? So it just, again, makes economic sense. So these push factors versus pull factors, a push factor and a pull factor. Let me give you some examples. One of the things that I like to do when I'm first working with a client is getting to know them, getting to know their business. And I do ask them questions about some of their personal motivations. And I think the audience can relate to this, whether you're a financial advisor or whether you're a business owner, because we're all humans, right? And we have mm -hmm. our personal motivations. So what might some of those motivations be? Looking to diversify my wealth. You mentioned that earlier. Yes, business owners might have 70% uh, of their net worth in their business. So inherently, they are not diversified. They're working with your RIA to diversify their portfolio, but that's only 30% of it. Yeah. The rest of it is non-liquid and, and certainly not diversified. The other motivation mm -hmm. might be, I want to cash out. I want to take some chips off the table. So that might lead to conversations around recapitalization, minority, majority uh, recaps. They might, as this mountain climber mentality, be, I want to start something new. I have a new business I want to start. Or another one might be, I want to get started in philanthropy. I want to just do something completely di drift different. I want to, or I want to be in the grandparent business. So that's the personal motivation side. Otherwise, you also might hear, uh, and those are positive things, largely, you know, um, you might hear things that are more uh, negative, like I'm burned out. 
I have health issues. I'm stressed out. I'm time starved. I, and I'm working 70 hour weeks or I have a family crisis. COVID has shown us that people are putting their family first in, in perhaps ways that they wouldn't have in the past. They appreciate having time as a currency. And yeah, they are making different decisions. And then the third category is this notion of personal peak. And so some of those exit might reasons might be, I'm bored. I want to spend time on a new hobby, go sailing. I want to travel or I want to focus on my health. You know, mm-hmm. I, I talked to a business owner the other day and he's in that situation. He's in his early 60s. And he said, honestly, I, I think I probably have two years left on this planet. So oh, wow. I want to sell my business. Yeah. And it's sad. And when I do workshops with Vistage and other CEO groups, one of the first things that I ask in the, to the audience, if I say the word transition, what comes to mind? So Mike, let's do this yeah. for you. Mike, if I say the word transition, what comes to mind? What words come to mind? Change is number one, right? So going okay. from one state to another. Mm-hmm. Um, it could mean end, right? So I guess, you know, end it could be beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, in the business context, it could mean, you know, retirement. It could be sale. Uh, could be promotion. Uh, yeah, like those are some of the core core ones that jump to my mind. Those are great words. Yeah. And I would say at first blush, those words from a positive, negative, neutral are positive and neutral. Mm-hmm. Right? They're not really negative. I guess it depends yeah, most, on the connotation. Yeah. But on its surface, I'd say they are positive to neutral. Well, translating this to what it means for a business owner in terms of maximizing their value potential We have some data around that, which actually shows that the positive and the neutral have a a five to six percent greater value than those that are negative in that same Mm. kind of category of size and and industry in terms of comparing. And so just taking that statistic, it's not a shocker because what we were saying earlier, if you're digging in, you're not really ready. You're in a personal crisis you have these negative factors that are more of a push as opposed to a pull. Guess what's likely to happen if we ask you a year or two after the sale, what is your emotional reaction to the sale? It is most likely going to be negative. And we have data on that too. It's actually Hmm. quite a high statistic that most owners are not happy one year or more after the sale. And there's reasons for that. I think largely it has to do with the push versus pull factor Another big reason is inclusion of employees in the process and some feelings about how things are uh, with employees after the sale. And so that's the other part of readiness and getting the business ready is we may want, when the time is right, to be considering how we involve um, some key people in the transaction. And I experienced some of that myself, right, being on the deal side. And I was absolutely brought into the loop and really valued that. And so when the time came for our deal to close, I was 100% supportive of it and behind it, whereas some others were just finding out about it on, and it was a surprise. You can imagine some of those feelings if you have a key employee that's been you for, been with you for 18, 20 years and they're just finding out about it and, um, you know, or they've just lost their job or what have you. The emotional side is very, very important. And I, and I do have a assessment that I use with folks and it's called the personal readiness assessment or the Uh, the pre-score, we call it. And it's a really cool tool because you can take this, you get a point value back out of 100 and you can say, okay, I'm a 60 out of 100. Wow. And and which of these core drivers do do I maybe need to really spend a little more time thinking about my personal readiness for a transition? And so I think it's important for not only advisors, if they want to include someone like me to introduce me to their client. I, I'll ask these questions. Um, they can be asking some of them themselves. It's really important to have these conversations with clients. If they, as the firm owner of the firm, are thinking about it as well, they can use this as a guide for how they're starting to think about their personal readiness. I love it. You know what? What what I think is interesting about that is you know you mentioned. It's very common after the dust settles from the, the the transaction, the transition, whatever it looks like, that there's some negative feelings about it. And what you just 
prescribed there is here's how you can avoid that, right? I think very often people, they aren't thinking about, one of the things we've heard a lot is on the advisor side is advisors who spend relatively little time thinking about life after the transaction or life after succession. I mean, they think about it like, oh, I'm going to retire or go to whatever, but they, they have spent relatively little time thinking about how they're going to fill their lives afterwards, right? All the positive things, whether it's travel, whether it's, uh, hey, travel's awesome, um, but you're not going to be traveling all the time. So what are you going to do like on Tuesday? <laughs> so, right. you know what well, there there's 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 like lots of stuff that you might be wanting like your your spouse right the husband or wife uh is suddenly gonna have you home more frequently uh how's that gonna go how are they gonna feel about that concept because you know they've got a life too that they've gotten used to and a lot of that time and i this kind of sounds mean it's not but a lot of that time it doesn't involve you <laughs> just, it's like they've got their own stuff going on and suddenly you're here all the time really <laughs> so i love yeah. the fact that you're talking about prepping for it yeah that and that goes back to your question of how much time do you need and it's so yeah. subjective in that sense because if your name is on the door if you are a family member and it's generational business if you are the founder and you feel so tied to it it may take you longer to transition yeah. out and leave. Yeah. One of the other, you know, if we go back to this notion of a three-legged stool, personal readiness, business readiness, financial readiness, I use another tool called the value builder assessment. When what comes back is more of the business readiness side. That mm. said, there's a question in that survey that I think is really telling and the question has multiple choice answers. So if it's okay with you, I'll read the question and yeah, I'll, I'll share the multiple choice. Actually, you have to pick one. Okay. okay. But you can see how this is tough. There might be people who say, okay. oh, I relate to more than one, but hey, sure, it's a radio sure. button in the survey, whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the question is, which of the following describes your biggest fear when it comes to selling your business. So we can put the word transition in there if people say, oh, sure. I don't want to sell. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. Which of the following describes your biggest fear when it comes to transitioning your, your company? Okay, first, not getting the value I think my business is worth. Two, not having anything to do in retirement. Three, disappointing my employees. Four, that no one can run things as well as I have. And five, that the legacy I have built will not continue or will change from what I would like it to be. That's fascinating. And you can see how like those questions will give somebody pause to think about, right? Is you know, immediately, you know, the I, and it, it's probably situational and dependent upon who you are. So as an example, I can see if the first choice of like not that getting the value, right? Like not getting the, the price point, if you will. Well, if the advisor or, or the, the business, the entrepreneur or the owner is like, I'm relying heavily on the proceeds of this sale to fund my retirement and the things I want to do for the rest of my life. There can be a lot of anxiety around how much am I getting for this this business sale you can see it right like this this is it right like, i, I want to go i just need to maximize the value that comes back to me to do these other things because I, I didn't save as much for retirement i pulled everything back into the business or whatever and then you can see like we talked about the whole you know what am i gonna do with myself <laughs> type of thing right but i could also for and I, I will have to say for myself i don't know i i I think a lot about legacy. I think you know, the one you talked about, like, you know, the legacy of like, what is this? I think a lot, I spend, I know I spend a lot of time wondering about like when the end comes for me, when I'm a hundred, because by the way, I'm living to a hundred. It's well-documented just so people know. Uh, <laughs> it's just a goal. Vitamins. You can have goals in life. Hundred is my goal. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, let's, we'll see what happens. My grandmother lived till 90. Come on, before a more modern uh, nutrition and stuff like that and exercise. So I'm going for it. Anyway, that being said, you know, I do think a lot about that. Like, okay, when, when I 
you know, flip the switch. Oh, geez, I've hit my microphone now twice. Sorry, everybody. Uh, when when the the end comes, will I feel happy with the the stamp I put on the world or the things I created, right? You know, so I'm, you know, I, I do some painting and, you know, I'm, I'm an artist and, and I've always been a creative person. Even when I create like Excel spreadsheets, I always kind of like the, oh, look at what I made. Isn't it beautiful how it works? It does this. It, I'm that kind of person, right? I yeah, well, even these podcasts. I like the feeling that after we did it, like, that, that was awesome. That was a great conversation between Laurie and myself. I love the way the video came out at the end of the editing process. Excellent, excellent job. Really proud of that piece of work, right? So legacy matters to me. Uh, so I can see that's tough. Ah, oh. what one tough. do you wrestle with most? By the way, how about like, like that, while I'm answering, what what one do you wrestle with most as you think about it? The question of what do I need and yeah. what do I want yeah. is really is a tricky one, and that's why I've mapped out a, a process. It starts with the hopes and dreams, right? We were just we we're just having yeah. a lot of this in the conversation. What personal business financial goals do I have? Yeah. How do I think about transition? And this next question is really important. And it's so key with investment advisors because they are in a wonderful position to be talking to business owners about this. They're from a they, mm -hmm. they're coming at it from a position of high credibility, right? They're all they have access yeah. and information about these hopes and dreams and are probably sitting down at least once a year with their clients to understand where their clients are about uh, their goals for the future, right? How long they expect to live their, their vision yeah. for the future and what they have to save for yada, yada. And if, if folks don't have that analysis, I, I have, I have some tools that helps present that. And that's really the second part, which is um, what I call a market assessment. It's the business okay. side, which is how much is my business worth today? And then is there a gap based on my exit goals? So let's say a client is uh, already working with an investment advisor and has a sense of, I need $10 million in my nest egg to help me live to 100 because I want to stop working at age 70 and that's 30 years and yeah. my draw is 3% a year and all those different math variables. And then the tool that I have works into the business side to say, okay, well, what will we call the freedom point where you are risk? What, at what point are you risk on? Which is the longer you keep your business, you're creating more risk for yourself. Mm -hmm. So what is that freedom point number? What is that freedom score? Which is essentially what's the value of the business that you need to get in order to fund the lifestyle and, and wealth definition that you have for yourself in the future. I just did this uh, exercise in a workshop with a client yesterday and her freedom score was, I'll just use rough numbers. Let's just say it was 3 million. Well, I did a business valuation for her and her business today is about 4 million. So she's in the gravy boat. Wow, yeah. that's a great place to be. So she wants to build, continue to build value in her company for the next 10 years. She's not contemplating a sale anytime soon, but she's also in this position of uh, what I like to say, what's your minimum number? So if someone yeah. comes a knocking at your door and says, I'm going to offer you 5 million, 6 million, 10 million, she knows her minimum's three. So she might say yes, even if it's sooner than what her exit plan is currently mapped out to be, right? If her, if her exit plan is 10 years from now, she might say yes sooner in, in a strategic fashion and, and, and cash out and go do something else. So this conversation about hopes and dreams, the market assessment, what's your business worth today? And is there a gap based on your exit goals is, is an awesome place to start. And I love having numbers to talk to because it really yeah. anchors you with your goals. If, I, if her situation was different, imagine if it was a different conversation. I said, oh, okay, you need 10. Your business is worth um, two and mm. your nest egg is you know not there yet. You need to sell your business for seven. She knows she's got a gap of 5 million of enterprise value to go work on. Yeah. Okay. We got 10 years to, to more than double our enterprise value. What are we going to do? Right. Yeah. And so that leads to the third and fourth sections, which is, okay, what drives the value of my business? 
And how can I increase the value of my business, which is not an easy answer. That's not a, just a sit down and say, here it is, but it takes some work. And then the last part, of course, is action planning. And what I do then is work with them, not only on the short term priorities, but also the bigger picture and how it's tying into a strategic plan. So you have your strat plan, which is your operating plan. But a lot of times what we'll do is have more of a strategic exit value plan transition plan, because you're not going to put that in front of your business operators until you're really ready. Right. And so we may have two strat plans that we're working on. Of course, they're dovetailing, but your key lieutenants may not know that until the time is right. I absolutely love this, this conversation. And it's kind of, you're you're teeing up the next conversation, part of the conversation I want to have as we're kind of rounding our third and heading for home here. Um, This is one of the, the things that put us together, right? Of, helping a business owner plan for the exit and what role does an advisor play in that? And can an advisor be active in, in, in doing this in a, in a way that brings on new clients, right? Like, obviously you want to do it for your existing clients. You want to make sure that you're helping them plan and it kind of exactly going through the process you're talking about. How much do you need to retire on when you decide to retire? How much of that is coming from the business? How much is that coming for your portfolio? What does that look like? Uh, let's get a business valuation done. Let's talk, like, let's bring in an expert like Laurie in here, you know, other people to, to evaluate that thing. So we know, right? Uh, and advisors should be doing that for themselves as well, using the Truelytics tools and, and so forth. But one of the things I want to talk about is going out and actively looking for and trying to attract entrepreneurs who might be close to selling, right? Because you know, most financial advisors make their money from managing assets, right? And those assets are stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Usually they don't make their money helping you or advising you on your business, right? So they need that kind of liquidity, if you will. And and during our prep call, I think I, I shared a story with you of an advisor I met years ago. I had a speaking engagement for uh, a large broker dealers, uh, a population of top performers. And it just kind of happened up the, talking to this guy. And he's like, oh yeah, we're one of the, the biggest at this firm. And the way we got there was I made a decision. I didn't want to work with a lot of small clients anymore. It's like, I wanted to work with big clients and I wanted to grow large and quick. So he came up with a strategy. He went out and did some analysis and found business owners in the local area who had businesses that he estimated to be worth $50 million or more. And he went to town creating these leather bound personalized presentations and he mailed them out like FedEx, you know, to them, to each one of these, uh, these people and said, Hey, listen, we think your business is worth at least this. Uh, we know you're in this age bracket we would love to help you evaluate selling this business. Everything we do for you on that side is free. What we want is we want to be able to manage the money when you sell the business basically, right? And it was kind of a really ingenious thing. And he grew his business to over a billion dollars AUM like relatively quickly in a few short years. I thought it was fantastic. So for me, it got me thinking like, I want to talk to Laurie about like, how does, how do we go about discovering entrepreneurs who might be open? I mean, it seems like one strategy and that was just kind of a high level. And I probably butchered the story a dozen different ways, but like, how do advisors go about, well, working with you uh, and and, and folks on your team, but uh, in this arena, but also, you know, discovering them in their own communities and so forth. Absolutely. There's a few ways for me personally. And, and I should mention Stony Hill advisors, is the firm that I'm partnered with uh, to represent to represent business owners in the lower middle market for a mm-hmm. buy sell transaction, and we love having referral arrangements with with folks, and so we can have that as formal or informal based on the policies of their firm. Uh, if you're interested in in following up with me on that directly, I'd love to talk to you. So that's certainly one way. Is is let's let's create a referral relationship with each other. If you have a business owner relationship and you know that person's looking for sale uh, to sell or looking to acquire a business, uh, you know, we can help. We can be additive to that. We can collaborate in the process. And so the, the exit is a win for, for you and your firm because the funds will be coming back. And then on the flip side, I do have clients that do not have a wealth advisor and I do make, you know, referrals. I do make referrals and, and clients appreciate that because mm-hmm. I become a trusted advisor to them. And, 
And I do that for attorneys and accountants and wealth managers. Those are like the three main categories. Bankers is another example. So those would be the folks I would say, I call them centers of influence or COIs. And to create a network of COIs, whether they're geography based, they're in your city and, you know, we can meet for lunch or coffee. I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but I've networked with people outside of Pittsburgh as well. And I think you could also be tying in with some other networking groups. Those are more maybe individual based uh, networking, but groups that you might want to take a look at in your local market or virtual would be the Exit Planning Institute. They do have chat. Yeah, they have (laughs) chapters across the United States. Um, If you don't have a chapter in your area, you might be able to attend virtual. Uh, So in Pittsburgh, welcome, you know, you're welcome to join up on the on the Exit Planning Institute Pittsburgh list and and reach out to me if you have any issues with that. But um, so another example uh, would be uh, BEI uh, business. Um, I always disclose by BEI, so I don't remember the, the original acronym, but so excuse yeah. me, uh, but they're based in Colorado. They have excellent, excellent um, educational material and they do webinars and there might be opportunities for networking. There's conferences. Yeah. EPI does a conference annually or now we're back to getting into in-person conferences and things. Yeah. So there are organizations like that, that I think you can tap into and, uh, and try to benefit. But I love, you know, I love the one-on-one, excuse me, the one-on-one and uh, things like zoom have made it so much easier to do a virtual yeah. coffee and yeah. connect. I love it. You know, it's, it's interesting. You hit on two things that are so near and dear to my heart right now. Number one, uh, location doesn't matter anymore, right? You're based in Pittsburgh. I'm here in Austin, Texas, and we are talking face to face and, you know, it, there, there's nothing that would preclude us, right. From being able to work together, uh, why does location matter anymore, right? Unless I have to, I don't know, have some sort of operation where we're handing each other stuff all the time. And by the way, there's shipping. You you know that business well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. They've gotten very efficient uh, if Amazon has taught us nothing. Uh, the other thing you hit on that I think is so important here, and we talk a lot about this on the show ever since its origin, right? Talking about niche-based marketing that advisors should have a niche and focus on a niche. And, and very oftentimes we fall into... Um, Conversation that niche is serving people who are in the tech industry, doctors, lawyers, uh, people who went to your your college, whatever. But there is also a niche of like a solution based niche, right? People who are experiencing this type of thing. So I've met advisors who service widows, right? So it's it's not about the 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 widow's uh, industry or where she came from. It's like no no no. no. I service people who recently lost their husbands, right? And and they they need help. Or we've met people who work with folks who are going through divorce, right? And 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 they've become a financial advisor who deals with people who are recently divorced and helps them get their financial lives, chart the new course and so forth. So here is an example of working with people who are potentially selling their business, right? Over time, you develop an expertise. Your marketing message becomes much more laser focused, right? Because there are unique needs where somebody is about to have a the planning piece that comes before, and then they're going to have a lump sum, or they're going to have a buyout and earn out with cash flow comes over time. And how do they manage all that type of stuff? So there are some unique challenges that that person goes through that uh, having an advisor on staff is going to, is going to help. So I, I love this conversation. Okay. Last one. This is my fun one. And this is what originally I thought we're, when, when we got connected, I thought this is what I want to talk about. So, but it's only gonna be a little few minutes. I wanna get your ideas because I I think you've probably seen this before. So it's very common for a business to have plateaued or potentially been declining for some years as it leads up to the point where the owner is finally like, I'm gonna sell this thing. I'm gonna get out from under it. I'm gonna retire or whatever. And, And that kind of makes sense, right? As we slow down, as we age, we are spending more time with, with our grandchildren or, or our spouse and we're traveling a little bit. Just, you start to shift into lifestyle. I always kind of like call it the, you know, the, the fat and lazy kind of playing a lot of golf type of thing. And, and, and the business is still there. It doesn't need as much work, but you know, you, you lose one client or one account here or there. For advisors, it's like, you know, they're, their clients are usually around the same age as they are. So when an advisor is getting around like 67, 68 years old, so are their clients. And so their clients are retiring and starting to consume their wealth. And in fact, we had Kieran Boll on from um, Price Metrics by McKinsey not too long ago. And he shared a, a mind-blowing stat where it was like 
40% of financial advisors are in negative net flows, meaning that more money is leaving their business every year than is coming in. So that, and that kind of makes sense, the bell curve, right? You know, 40% of advisors are kind of in that, the tail end of their business. It got me thinking, if I'm thinking about buying a business or selling a business, what's the process for doing so when the business is shrinking? And so if, have you worked with people who are looking to sell a business that's been shrinking or buy a business that's, that's shrinking? And, and, and how do you navigate that? There's always going to be risks and opportunities in a business, and mm. those will be valued in an infinite number of possible ways in the private market by a potential buyer. This conversation could probably be its own episode, honestly. I probably have to come back. Maybe for we part will have two. one. As well. <laughs> <laughs> so, at a real high level, yeah. uh, you know, value is in the eye of the buyer. What are they looking for? They're looking for a predictable flow of future cash. So what is going to, um, you know, you're, you have an audience that's well familiar with math and the, the present value that, of that future cash flows, if it starts to look like it's in a decline, that's going to hurt your potential, right? They're going to apply more of a discount to your business, which means a lower multiple, which means lower enterprise value. So inherently, if you have a declining business, that presents risk, that presents probably a lower value than what you might want. And, and that's just the reality of the situation. Why? Again, it's just math because yeah. the buyer is looking to um, have growth. They're looking to get a return on their investment. And so if that investment is more risky, it's just like in the investment portfolio, right? If more yeah. risky investments are, you're expecting a higher return. Um, yeah. So applied differently in the formula, that means a lower enterprise value. Yeah. And that's a big, big part of it. There's other factors that drive value, uh, such as the size of the of the business. Um, there is a size discount for smaller businesses. And I think in this, the nature of AUM, it's sort of about the net proceeds as opposed to measuring that top line. It's because that's, sure. you have to net out what is, you know, what is the firm bringing in in terms of uh, profitability and the measure, uh, the measure generally is on EBITDA, or it can be on seller discretionary earnings. There's probably in this industry a formula around AUM. Uh, nonetheless, that there's going to be a formula that's applied. And so, if we know that there are some factors in the business that would be more of a detractor to value, can we come up with what we believe would be um, transferable assets that might enhance the value? And those could be a number of things. It could be intangibles around the brand or goodwill associated with the with the business, with the firm. Uh, if it's been around a long time and has an excellent reputation and it has quantifiable, um, whether it's, you know, for some businesses, Google results or you have net promoter yeah. score or there's, you know, some quantifiable. Another thing, it would be the contact database that maybe a firm is getting acquired and its real asset is the list of clients that it, yeah. that it has or has had. Um, and there's some, you know, kind of value associated with that. It could be any number of things. And yeah. the, the bottom line is, is in a declining business, we just have to be realistic about, um, you know, what is that sellable, what's the sellable market price and yeah. making sure that there's not a big disconnect between what the seller thinks they're going to get and then what the market is is saying is really a dictated more of a market value price. There can be a yeah. gap there and that's really frustrating on all sides, um, especially if an advisor is working you know, to sell this business and uh, you know, they get multiple offers and they're all rejected and yeah. that, that happens from time to time. Yeah. Uh, but it's a tricky it's a tricky situation and I think you know both sides have to be realistic that you're not necessarily going to get top dollar. You yeah. may get it. You, we want you to punch above your weight class for your multiple. And if there's more risk in your business, you most likely will not. Yeah, I love. I think, by the way, thank you very much for going through like all, all, all the, the, the the your thoughts there and, and your experience. The thing that popped out to me the most, and and, and we've kind of talked a little about it, hit hit on it a tiny bit in this show, is look for things that are undervalued that are that if the buyer gets or you know 
they can turn it into more value, right? And if I'm a buyer, I'm thinking that same way. It's always kind of like the real estate analogy is what I always use. When you're buying a rental property, you're not buying the rental property for what it is today. It's it's what what revenue could I take out of it in the future, right? So what if I put a nice coat of paint on it? What if I change out the appliances? Could I charge more like uh, for the rent? In other words, I, I can get more revenue than it's getting today or has been getting because I can make some improvements to the product. And so as you mentioned, the, you know, the, the, the customer database or whatever, or very, very often it might just be like, Hey, there's synergies here. Like when I add that business to my business, it's worth way more than that business is all on its own. And my business is on it. I'm going to get some things out of it that they don't even know is sitting there type of thing. So, and same thing as a seller, you should think about like, here's some hidden values here, even though the revenue may have plateaued a little bit. Well, Laurie, this has been uh, honestly really fantastic. I, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I know that many of the advisors who are listening and, and, and other members of our audience are probably like, you know, I, I want to talk to Laurie. I want to hear more about this. So small dot big, small dot B-I-G dot com is your website. Uh, how else can people follow up with you and stay connected with you to kind of like keep, you know, getting your Sherpa insights along the path? <laughs> uh, there's a couple of ways. So smalldotbig.com, small.big is my website. And you can sign yeah. up for my newsletter on the site for sure. And LinkedIn is fantastic. I love LinkedIn. You can DM me on LinkedIn and let me know that you heard me on Modern Financial Advisor podcast. I love connecting with my audience. I uh, would love to have you follow the show on LinkedIn. Follow wherever you listen to podcasts. We're available on all the podcast platforms. The show is called Succession Stories. Wonderful. And we'll make sure we get all of that stuff linked up in the show notes so that people can just click and go there and so forth. But this has been fantastic. Thank you so very much, Laurie. Pleasure having you on the Modern Financial Advisor podcast. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much for listening to and or watching this episode of the Modern Financial Advisor podcast. It's always fantastic to have you with us. Huge thanks to Laurie Barkman from small.big for joining me as well today. I learned a ton from her. Really grateful for all the insights and strategies and tips and tricks that she shared. I hope you take some of that stuff and use it to serve your clients who are happy to be business owners and heck, go out and find some new ones, right? This is some really good stuff action packed on this show, okay? As always, please do make sure you like and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast platform if you have not done so already. What the heck are you waiting for? And if you have a question or a suggestion for a guest or a topic for the show, you know what to do. Hit us up, podcast at truelytics.com or swing by the website, use a little contact form there or just, hey, if you're seeing this on social media, you know what you can do? Comment below. Love to hear from you and make sure you share this with your community as well. All right. Hope you're having a great day. Please stay safe and be nice to each other. We will see you next time on the Modern Financial Advisor Podcast. See ya. Bye.